Hello, welcome to worship. This is a virtual opportunity that I trust will enhance your own relationship with God as we worship him together and as we uh, take some time to reflect upon his holy word. I do want to take a few moments to uh, let you know that uh, we continue to move through the season that is typically called Lent, uh, leading into the final week uh, of the season that uh, leads us into Easter Sunday and the resurrection celebration. Uh, the week leading into Easter is often referred to as Holy Week, and on your screen I've listed some of the special worship opportunities that will be available during that week. First of all, Sunday, April 10th, Palm Sunday at 10 o'clock, our usual in-person worship time. The choir will be performing the cantata Victor's Crown. Then on, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> then on uh, Thursday evening, April 14th, at 6 o'clock p.m., uh, our Monday Thursday communion service. On Friday, April 15th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, we will be providing uh, a Stations of the Cross self-guided worship experience. There will be several stations set up within the sanctuary for you to visit. Uh, it is self-guided. There will be instructions at each location in terms of material to help you reflect upon one or another aspect of Christ's journey to Calvary's cross. Uh, come and go at any time in that time frame that is best for you. With that in mind, uh, we are here to worship today as well, and so uh, I invite us to uh, come together as we uh, recite together this historic affirmation of our common faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please join me in today's call to worship. Remember the good news that we have received and proclaimed this day, the good news in which we stand and through which we are being saved. We will remember and hold tightly to the truth we proclaim with joy. Christ died for our sins as the scriptures said he would. But the story doesn't end in death. Christ was raised on the third day, just as it was promised. We are witnesses to the good news, and God commands that we not keep that good news to ourselves. We will testify to all that Christ is Lord. One of the ways that we testify to the Lordship of Christ in our life is through the celebration of Holy Communion. A little later in this service, we will be celebrating Holy Communion. Uh, so between now and then, you may wish to uh, find a, a couple of items to have handy at that point. Uh, something that you can drink to remind you of the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, typically, we use grape juice, but it does not necessarily need to be grape juice. Uh, and then uh, something uh, by way of uh, a bread item to consume as we celebrate the body of Christ given for you and given for me. We will uh, be celebrating that following uh, the message today as we remember and proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Please join me for a few moments as we become before what uh, the Bible tells us is God's throne of grace, a metaphor for what it means to come to him in prayer and to be able to come to him freely and unhindered without fear of any kind of retribution, without fear of being turned away, without fear of judgment. All that was handled by the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so with the freedom that we have in Jesus, I invite us to pray together these words. O oh God of all creation, you came into the world that we might know love and new life. Pour your spirit on your church that it may fulfill Christ's command to live the gospel everywhere and that the proclamation of the good news might be heard throughout the earth. Reassure us that we are your beloved people. Defend us against all evil and temptation. Give us grace to bear faithful witness to you. And do us with love, keep us constant in prayer, empower us for the service of love. Amen. I also realize that uh, each of us have very personal requests and needs and praise items for the Lord. So at this point in time, I would like to pause for a moment to allow each of us to offer those to the Lord. Following that period of time, uh, we'll conclude our prayer by uh, sharing together in the prayer that Jesus taught. Take a few moments now to simply offer praise and petition of the Lord and whatever concerns you might have. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus himself taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom Thine is the power, thine is the glory, forever and ever. Amen. One thing I would like you to be aware of is that uh, as we now uh, commemorate and honor the tradition of supporting the work that God has entrusted to us through our tithes and offerings, uh, that uh, during the last couple of weeks, we have uh, opened up the opportunity for a special offering uh, that is specifically going to be designated for some of the United Methodist rel relief efforts from the victims of the war in the Ukraine. Uh, should you wish to uh, contribute directly to that, uh, you can contact the church office where we have uh, information of how you can do that and where to send your gift. 
Alternatively, if you were to mark on your check uh, or in the electronic giving box that you would like your gift to go directly to that support, you are welcome to do so. Just a reminder that uh, there are several ways in which to uh, uh, offer your tithes and offerings to the Lord. One is to mail them to the church via the regular mail or bring them here to the office or leave in the lockbox that is outside the office door. Of course, we have an online giving option that you can find at marinerumc.org. Uh, simply use the link that is, praying, that is uh, displayed when you go to the website. Let us pray and just thank God for his blessings and the opportunity to share those blessings with him. Father, you have showered us with many blessings, both material and spiritual. But Father, as we offer to you a, a material offering of tithes and offerings, they are in gratefulness for the infinite spiritual blessings that you have showered upon us. And Lord, while we have different capacities to be able to give to you, each of us can give with a common heart of joy and praise for what you've done for us in Jesus. To that end, we surrender these tithes and offerings in his most precious name. Amen. If he keeps on blessing and blessing, if he keeps on pouring it on, if his love just keeps getting richer, if he keeps on giving a song, if my cup gets fuller and fuller, if my prayers keep on getting through, if it keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. When I gave my heart to Jesus, when I claimed him as my king, when the gloom and fear was lifted, my old heart just started to sing. Then the song just kept getting bigger, and it thrilled my heart through and through. If it keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. If he keeps on blessing and blessing, if he keeps on pouring it on, if his love just keeps getting richer, if he keeps on singing a song, if my cup gets fuller and fuller, if my prayers keep on getting through, if it keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. If he keeps on blessing and blessing, if he keeps on pouring it on, if his love just keeps getting richer, if he keeps on giving a song, if my cup gets fuller and fuller, if my prayers keep on getting through, if he keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. If it keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. If it keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Most of us are familiar with the uh, terminology of figure of speech. The figure of speech quite often involves a statement which uh, isn't necessarily literally true, but it does illustrate or give us a facet or an idea of what a truth might look like. For example, uh, the Bible tells us that God is a rock. <laughs> well, I don't think God is a physical rock as we know it, but that figure of speech that we know as a metaphor is a way to describe God in such a way that it reminds us that God is solid, someone we can depend upon. God is also illustrated in the Bible as a flaming fire. 
Well, I doubt that he's both a rock and a flaming fire, and really neither one. But uh, God, as a flaming, consuming fire, reminds us again of, of the power of God and the prestige of God, and also the light of God. So with these in mind, uh, the passage we're going to look at today uses a particular figure of speech that uh, uses irony. And uh, irony, as, the, as uh, Merriam-Webster defined it, is an incongruity, a difference between the actual result of the situation and the normal or expected result. And so uh, we're going to be reading a story where Jesus does some very unexpected things. It's a story of several different ironies, but they do illustrate for us something of the heart of Jesus, particularly for those that some of us may not always deem worthy of his attention and his grace. Certainly a person that his immediate disciples had yet to learn how to accept and to love. So with that in mind, allow me to read this story. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. But Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said, for even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. Uh, for most of us, uh, we're familiar with these items here, eyeglasses, uh, for reading or for usual and regular purposes. What's interesting about eyeglasses, if you have your eyes examined, typically the prescription for one eye is not necessarily identical to the other. And so when the eyeglasses are made, they have to adjust the uh, prescription for each lens to make sure that it allows each eye to see appropriately. There are at least two lenses through which we can read the story that I've just read to you. One is the story of someone on the outside looking to be brought to the inside. This was a woman who lived in an area and were of a religious persuasion that supposedly was not included in the itinerary and uh, the compassion that most people had experienced with Jesus Christ. It was a region where people uh, were considered to be outcasts. And so one lens in which we can look at this story is the lens of someone looking at a woman on the outside, undeserving of the attention of Jesus Christ because she's on the outside, and someone that, that at least initially the disciples of Jesus Christ should stay there on the outside of things. The other lens that we can use to look at the story is the lens of a mom with a desperately ill daughter. Ah, it's a very different lens, is it not? Instead of a generic judgmental statement uh, anonymously assigning to this woman, well, she's just an outsider seeking to be in, we look at the story of a mother who has a daughter who's ill. And somewhere along the line, we don't know how or where, she had the idea through uh, either the teaching or hearsay or uh, word of mouth, whatever it might be, that Jesus might just be able to do something about that. And so she comes to Jesus with her plea. So allow me in this story to walk through several of the ironic things that are mentioned in this story that I believe help us better understand it, particularly from the standpoint of a mom with a sick child. The first diner, I would say, Jesus is dining with the very people he did not come for. You know, as we read that story, Jesus said, I only came for the lost sheep of Israel. Well, if that were literally the case, there are two problems. 
First of all, Jesus intentionally is in a geographical area where the lost sheep of Israel do not reside. So if he did not come for them, why is he even there to begin with? Okay? So that's one irony that we look at. Why is Jesus even there? Well, as I mentioned, an irony is a statement that is contrary to the expected result. And in this particular case, it is true that Jesus' primary mission between the time of his birth and death as he walked this earth was primarily and initially to a group of people who were his kinfolk. It was not entirely limited to them. And when Jesus says here that uh, he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel, he's basically repeating kind of the common understanding of what people believe to be about him. Irony number two. The disciples try to send her away, thinking it's the right thing to do. You know, one of the things I notice about reading about the disciples is uh, they're growing just like you and I are growing. And for whatever reason, they really didn't think that Jesus should be spending her, his time with this particular mom. And so uh, as, uh, um, as the disciples were observing and uh, kind of annoyed by her persistence, they told Jesus, can you just let, just send her away, okay? She's just bothering us and she's bothering you. They tried to do this with children. They tried to do this with the feeding of the 5,000. There were several points. And the irony is these are the very people that eventually Jesus is going to entrust with the responsibility to actually bring people to himself. But they're not there yet. They're a work in progress. And so one of the ironies we see here is that the disciples are doing that very thing that Jesus is going to have to help them understand. They need to break that habit at some point and understand that Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, really did come for all people. And that a primary role that they're going to have once his departure from this planet is to invite people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. A third irony that we see in this particular passage is that Jesus behaves very un-Jesus-like. For one thing, when the woman first approaches him, he's totally silent. I can identify with that. There are times when I've gone to Jesus with concerns and it just seems like he's not listening. It doesn't mean he isn't, but it just feels that way to me. And it almost feels that way in the story that uh, the words that the woman initially brings to Jesus is her plea for help just goes in one ear and out the other. And Jesus is just basically ignoring uh, the desperation of this woman. And so that's a very un-Jesus-like thing to do. And when he finally does answer her, um, well, he uses a couple of phrases that we might be surprised. He says... Uh, he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. We know that. And then she repeats again, even more emphatically. He says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Why does Jesus say such a horrendous thing? Well, you know, I can't prove this in an absolute sense, but I believe that I have a sanctified suggestion for what Jesus is getting at. I believe that Jesus is only saying to her what she is already thinking. She knows what Jesus' kinfolk say about people like her. Because one of the derogatory terms that was used of folks from this region who were considered by so many to be unworthy of the grace and mercy of God was that they were dogs. And so when Jesus says that to her, he says, you know what they're saying about you, don't you? That you're just dogs. So why should I spend time with you? To which she comes back with a, a very, very, good answer, I think. She says, yeah, you're right. That's what they say about us, Jesus. But even us dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Wow, what a statement of faith. In fact, Jesus commends her from her faith because she dares to believe two things. She first of all dares to believe that she can be included in Jesus' grace and mercy and healing ministry. She chooses to trust that Jesus ultimately will not turn her away. And so her persistence is a reflection of her trust in Jesus, even though there were many points here where she could turn and walk away from Christ. Nevertheless, she didn't do so. And I believe that's one reason that Jesus says she has great faith. She never stopped believing that Jesus not only could, but would make a difference for her. 
The other thing that I think is involved in that statement of faith is that she recognizes, Jesus, I just need a crumb. I just need a crumb of faith. E e even us people that everyone else considers dogs, if you would but give us a crumb from where? The master's table. You're the master. If you would but toss me a crumb, that's all my daughter needs. And I think that's such an important lesson because you know what? Sometimes we think we have to have a great quantity of faith. When in reality, sometimes I know your faith, my faith is weak. We're uncertain. All it takes is a crumb. And, and, and so it's not so much about having a great faith as it is about having faith in someone who's great, which is that this woman does in the relationship that she has with Jesus Christ. So two reasons I think Jesus um, commemorates her faith. One is her persistence, and the other is she understands that I, I just need a morsel, a bit of your time. You're so powerful that even a crumb carries a tremendous effect. And then the final irony I would say to you, what's really interesting to me here is the Canaanite woman, supposedly on the outside, supposedly really not someone that would be normally included in the entourage of Jesus, recognizes who he is even more so than some of his more immediate disciples, at least at this point in time. He is the one that loves the mom with the child and recognizes the need for mercy and grace in the midst of a situation where everybody else looking on simply saw her as an outsider. And so today, as we reflect upon this passage, think about this. Have you ever felt like an outsider when it comes to God? Have you ever felt like, you know, I'm just a dog? Uh, I'm, I'm not part of the church-going crowd. I'm not part of the usual folks that I would assume God would attend to and God would pay attention to. And because of that, I just assume that God really doesn't really have much interest in me. This woman's story tells us undoubtedly that God has a very deep interest in you. And while God would love to have you a participant in, in, in a faith community, in a local church, it is not a means by which God accepts us. It's a means by which we can explore and go more deeper in the faith that we have. And so I encourage you this day, if you're feeling a bit on the outside, God loves you. God wants to include you. And if I, as pastor of this church, can be of any help in that journey, uh, I stand ready to do so. The other thing I would say is, do we sometimes, even inadvertently, exclude people that God wants to be included in his forever family? Uh, maybe we make assumptions. Uh, maybe our faith is, uh, needs a little bit more instruction. Uh, maybe we really don't appreciate the depth of God's grace and mercy and the extent to which it's going to go. And, and so for you, we may inadvertently uh, send a signal to some people like the disciples did here. Well, not so inadvertently. But nevertheless, say, you know, just send her away. May I tell you that God will never send you away. And I will tell you that our church will never send you away. All are welcome. God bless you today. Remember this. God loves you so very, very much. As we prepare to celebrate the elements of Holy Communion, I remind you once again that hopefully you've gathered a couple of items for this time together. Uh, one is something to drink to commemorate the blood of Christ, be it grape juice or some other type of juice that you have there. Or uh, in addition to that, excuse me, an item of bread uh, that you can use to remember together the body of Christ given for us. We begin this time together by reading together the reminder of the significance of these elements. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Continuing on together, all glory and thanksgiving to you, Holy Father. For on the night before he died, your son Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it to remember me. Therefore, loving God, recalling your goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. And so we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come in glory. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer through Christ, our great high priest. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ, and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for service of your kingdom. And now I invite you to take whatever item you have there uh, representing the body of Christ through an item of bread. And I will remind you, as we have just uh, read, that in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, his body was broken on Calvary's cross. It was given for us. And I invite you now to take and eat of this bread, remembering as you do the body of Christ given for us. In much the same way, after the disciples had eaten of the bread, Jesus passed the cup. And when he passed the cup, he said, this cup of wine contains uh, what is to be the spiritual presence of my blood. Take and drink of this as you um, um, take and eat of, drink of this as often as you do now in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Praise be to God. Father, thank you for the reminder through these elements that you are ever present with us through the blood and the body of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we have commemorated that event, we recognize that in these elements we also proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, as uh, we now move forward from this time of worship, help us to be faithful in that very witness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When Stephen was accused, lonely and bewildered, no one that day would stand by his side. He looked up. I 
I just look up like a Stephen to the right hand of the Father and he rose.